and turn to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. We're in chapter 9, and we'll finish this chapter uh, tonight, starting in verse 30. Romans chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 30. The book of Romans is a really good verse to explain to you what happened to you when you got saved. Uh, it, uh, it shows the, the things that took place. Hey, Brother Philip, good to see you, brother. It shows the things that took place uh, inside of you that uh, you didn't even know took place. Uh, so uh, pretty much what uh, all you knew when, when you got saved was you were on your way to hell and you didn't want to go to hell. And so you trusted in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to save your soul so you wouldn't have to go to hell. And that's pretty much the extent of it when you got saved. But what happened to you? <laughs> You, when you read, begin to read the book of Romans, you find out that the Lord did a lot of stuff for you. For example, he justified you. Uh, justified means to be made just as if I'd never sinned. So when God looks at you, he looks at you as if you've never committed one sin in your entire life. Amen. Imagine that. <laughs> I would venture to say that I'm not looking at a bunch of folks who haven't sinned before. But when God sees you, he sees Jesus Christ and he sees someone who's sinless. What else did he do? Well, Jesus Christ was, was your propitiation. Propitiation means to make peace. And so what happened is, the, uh, is God was angry at you and his wrath abode over top of you or lived on top of you. And Jesus Christ made peace with God on your behalf so he wouldn't be angry with you anymore and send you to hell because of your sins. He's the one that made peace with God. Uh, then he adopted you into a family. Think about that. Now, that's why around here we'll call each other brothers and sisters, right? We'll say, brother, hey, sister, how you doing? Uh, he gave you assurance of your salvation. So then you can know, you don't have to doubt your salvation. He sealed you by the Holy Spirit of God. A Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, and he sealed you with the, whole, with the Holy Spirit so you could never lose that salvation. So a lot of things took place. You are born again. You had a new man born on the inside. A lot of things took place you didn't even know took place. Uh, and the book of Romans helps to explain all that. So we're in Romans chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 30. Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. <clears throat> now we'll turn to a few scriptures uh, tonight. And uh, if uh, you're unable to keep up, no problem. Just go ahead and write them down, or you can use the index in the front, and that will kind of help you find the books quickly. All right, Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. What shall we say then? that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. All right, what was that saying? All right, so he says, what, what shall we say then? So what, what am I going to say? That the Gentiles, so remember there's, there's three groups in the Bible. There's Jews, there's Gentiles, and then there's the church of God. So Jews, that's the folks who come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the Israel. That's the ones that everybody's hating right now over there in the, in the land of Israel. Those are God's chosen people. And, uh, and so you got Jews. Then you got Gentiles. Now, a Gentile is real easy. It's anybody who's not a Jew. <laughs> so unless you're a Jew here in this room, then you're a Gentile. That's pretty straightforward. Now, the church of God, that third group, the church of God, is what happens to you when you get saved. So when you get saved, you lose that identity in God's eyes. You lose that distinction as being a Jew or a Gentile. Now you're part of the church. You're part of the body of Christ. You're a saved individual. So there's three groups of people, the Jews, the Gentiles, the church of God. So uh, back in the Old Testament, the Jewish people had the law. God gave it to them. Uh, in the book of Romans chapter 3, it says, What advantage then hath the Jew? So what advantage is there to be in the, a Jew? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So the Jews had an advantage because they actually had the scriptures given to them. And the Gentiles, if they wanted to know the truth, they had to go to the Jews to figure out what the truth was. Because God had given them the scriptures and the Jews were responsible for proselytizing and they were responsible for getting it out. All right, so notice what it says. What shall we say then that the Gentiles, so I think we understand what that is. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, you and I pretty much in this room since none of us are Jews. So the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness. So how is it that the Gentiles, they weren't trying to follow after righteousness, that righteousness that came from the law. They weren't even trying to do the right thing. How in the world did they get or attain? How did they get righteousness? He says, even the righteousness, which is of faith. So when you got saved, it's because you had faith. For by grace are ye saved 
through faith. So here's what happens. When you get saved, when you get saved, God says, all right, I tell you what, <clears throat> I'll take your righteousness. And so he takes your righteousness and he puts it on his son. And then he takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and he gives it to you. So how in the world did I get the righteousness of Jesus Christ? I got it by faith. You see what it says in the text? He says, even the righteousness, which is of faith. All right, let's keep going. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. So here's Israel, and their, the Bible calls it the law of righteousness. Now hold your place here and, and flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. So Israel, that's those Jews. It's another uh, name for them. Deuteronomy 6. So that's the fifth book in your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and uh, the more you're, uh, the more, I know some of you are new in, in the Lord, but the more you read the Bible and, uh, and the more you're in church and listening to preaching, the faster you'll get at finding Scripture. And some of you have already found this in a few months that you're getting really fast at finding these things. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and let's look at verse 24. Deuteronomy 6, 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. So God gave him these commandments and the statutes, like, uh, like laws. And he said, it and it was to fear the Lord our God, and it was these things that were given to him were for their good always. Now, verse 25 explains the reason why. And it shall be our righteousness, the keeping of the law that they were given. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So before Jesus Christ showed up under that Old Testament law, they were supposed to keep that thing. And if they messed up, they had to go down and make a sacrifice. But when Jesus Christ shows up, he's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And you don't have to make a sacrifice anymore because Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. See that? All right, let me say it a different way. So if a fella broke one of the Ten Commandments or if he broke one of the laws, <clears throat> he'd have to come down to the, uh, to, the, to the temple. And he'd come down to the temple and he'd go to the door of the temple and he'd have to put his hand on the animal's head. <clears throat> now they would have different types of animals. Sometimes it would be a lamb. Sometimes it might be a goat or a bullet. We'll take a lamb for the sake of our illustration here. So he put his, his hands on the head of the lamb, and the idea was is that that lamb was going to bear the guilt of the sin that the man had committed. So it was almost as if he was transferring his sins onto this animal here, and then they would slit the throat of that animal, and that animal would bleed out. And then they would take that thing, and they'd flay it, and they'd put it there on, on the, the altar, and they would burn that lamb. But the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that it is not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sin. So that's why they would have to come down yearly and have to make a sacrifice. As a matter of fact, all the, ma all the males, I think it was from 20 to I think it was 60 years old, had to show up three times a year uh, uh, for these special uh, feasts and sacrifices. And so it's not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sin. But one day when Jesus Christ shows up, John the Baptist points at him and he goes, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So when Jesus Christ showed up, he had his blood. His blood was different than the blood of an animal's. Why was his blood different? Because his blood was God's blood. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says, Take heed therefore to feed the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. The blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross was God's blood because Jesus is God. You see that? And so that blood is perfect. That blood is not sinful. It's sinless. Jesus didn't have Adam's blood. He had God's blood. All right, so notice in verse 25 of, 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 Genesis, of Deuteronomy 6, he says, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God. So they were to observe the commandments. And this is called the righteousness which is of the law. Now this righteousness which is of the law, it's called our righteousness. It's a personal righteousness, and it does not equate to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So now, if you keep that in mind of what the Jews are trying to do, they're trying to keep the law of righteousness, but they haven't attained unto righteousness. So go back over to Romans chapter 9. 
He says, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, in other words, how come? How come they didn't get this, this law, this, uh, attain this righteousness like the Gentiles did? Because they sought it not of faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Now here's what's interesting is the Jews had that law back in the Old Testament, but as time went on, they weren't even keeping the law. They were keeping their interpretation of what they thought the law said. Uh, go over to Mark chapter 7 and you'll see what I'm talking about. Mark 7. Uh, how many ever heard somebody say, uh, well, that's just your interpretation? You ever heard that? And, uh, you know, for a lot of folks, that's what they do. They give their interpretation of the scriptures. But here's the thing. The Bible says no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So in other words, if you're reading the scripture and I'm reading the scripture, I shouldn't come up with something different than you come up with because it's got to go by what does it say? That's why the words are so important and why we make a big deal about the King James Bible. Because the very words themselves are important and when you change the words, you can change the meaning. It's like uh, uh, Dr. Ruckman uh, said one time, he said, it's not important what it means, what's important is what does it say. Because if you know what it says, then you'll know what it means. All right, look at Mark chapter 7. So as time went on in, uh, in Israel's history, they no longer took the word of God for this is what it says, and now they started adding their own flavor to it. So here's how it, here's how it goes. So verse 1 says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. So these are religious people, Pharisees and scribes. Scribes uh, were responsible for the writing of the scriptures, all right? Pharisees, they're the ones that walked around in the big long robes, the ones that, that Ralph told us if we buttoned up our, our button in our jacket, that, that's what we would be. <laughs> all right, verse 2. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, and then notice it explains what defiled means, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. So the disciples were eating, but they didn't wash their hands before they ate. And so they said they're defiled. And what they were thinking is that if they ate with hands that weren't washed, then it was going to go inside of them and it was going to defile them on the inside. Verse 3. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft. That's just an old English word. It means like often. Pretty simple, right? Pretty simple. Wash their hands oft, eat not, holding, and then watch it. The tradition of the elders. Oh, I see. So God gave a law back here in the Old Testament, and then over time, tradition started to seep its way in. Notice how God feels about tradition. Verse 4, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. So they're coming from the market, like the marketplace or the store. And if they don't wash their hands, they don't eat. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. So they had all these different little nuances and traditions for washing uh, pots, cups, tables, different types of materials, brazen vessels, so on and so forth. Verse 5, then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat, with, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So uh, why are your disciples, why are they eating bread and they're not following the tradition that the elders have laid out? How come they're not doing that and they're eating bread with unwashed hands? Verse 6, he answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. <laughs> I love the way Jesus talks because he's just straightforward. So now Isaiah, that's Isaiah. Uh, so Isaiah is the Hebrew uh, word. Isaiah, that would be Greek. And so that's how his name uh, comes over into English, Isaiah. Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, and he calls them hypocrites. As it is written, now watch, watch what he says. This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now you know what that, that, you guys don't know what this is saying. I think you're kind of getting how we're reading the scriptures. You just take it at face value. So what is they're doing? They're saying something with their mouth, but their heart isn't behind it, you know. 
I mean, uh, anybody ever had something like that where you were told to do something and you just said, yes, sir, I'll get it done, but your heart was nowhere near it. <laughs> and we've all had situations like that, right? Now, when it comes to the Lord, though, we want it to be where what our mouth says matches what our heart says. That's obvious, okay? So now here he is, and he's telling them, he's saying, look, the prophet Isaiah spoke about you guys and said, you honor me with your mouth, all right? Your mouth is honoring me, but your heart, it's far from me. So in other words, it's not true honor because you can make your mouth say anything, right? Uh, if you, were to, you ever heard somebody uh, uh, flattery, you guys know what flattery is, is where you just start heaping praise upon someone. You got to be careful about that, about flattery. Sometimes you got to, uh, you know, don't let it go too much to your head <laughs> and, and wonder why is this individual telling me this? Uh, somebody heaping flattery, they don't mean it with their heart. Now, verse seven, and here's what they're doing. How be it in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? Oh, I see. So what are they doing? So how is it that they're, that they're honoring the Lord with their lips or their heart is far from the Lord? How is it? Because they're worshiping the Lord and their worship is in vain. Because the worship that they're doing is not the way God said to worship him. They're worshiping him in vain because they're coming after the commandments of men and the traditions of men and worshiping the Lord that way. And you're to come to the Lord the way he told you to come not with the commandments of men and traditions. He says in verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God. Now remember, he's talking to the guys who were actually were given the commandments of God. That's who the, Jew, the Jews got the commandments of God. And he says, laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. And then he calls it out as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. I'll tell you, the best thing you can do is don't worry about tradition. Worry about what does the book say? That's what you need to worry about. And then he says in verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. So that's the thing what a Bible believer does. A Bible believer takes the word of God and he says, Okay, what does the scripture say? And if the scripture says one thing or tradition says another, you throw tradition out and you stay with the word of God every single time. That's what you do. All right, let's, uh, for, uh, let's go at verse 10. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother, and whosoever curseth father or mother, let him die the death. That's what Moses said. Then he says, but ye say, so Moses said you're to honor your father and mother, and if you curse them, back under that Old Testament law, they would kill them. <laughs> Could you imagine if that's what they did today? <laughs> There would be very few kids around. <laughs> I, I've seen, man, I, I tell you what, this, this, this world is getting crazy. I've seen some little five-year-old kids who can cuss worse than a sailor. <laughs> I mean, it's to shock you what some of them can say. If we were living in an Old Testament law, well, that would eliminate that problem. Now, the problem is there's no discipline in the home. That's the problem. Right, now, verse 11, it says, But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, and then he explains what the word korban means. See, you don't have to, there's no private interpretation here. You just, what, is, what does it say? Korban, that is to say a gift. So that's what korban is. It means a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. <laughs> so as long as the guy got the right money and, you know, and he says, well, it's a gift, you know, then you kind of let him off the hook for what he did because you're, you know, you're getting something out of it. It's just crooked. It's just absolutely crooked. Uh, you know, uh, you've hear, heard the stories of uh, guys, and they'll they'll go out and they'll they'll uh, be a part of the, the the mob, and they'll end up you know whacking somebody, and then come to confession and make their confession, and they're all right. Amen. Well, you know, he makes you put a little money in the you know thing as you go out. You know what the Bible says about that? Notice verse thirteen. Oh, we got to read verse twelve. Keep the, keep the context. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or for his, or his mother. So you're letting him off the hook. Verse 13, making the word of God of none effect. How? Through your tradition, which ye, del which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So he was just giving him one example and says, this is a tradition that you guys have and make the word of God of none effect. Now, do you know what God thinks about his word? 
He thinks very highly of his word. Take your Bible, cut it in half, go to Psalms, the book of, Psalm, uh, book of Psalms. And uh, I think it's Psalm 139 that I want. I got to try to get ahead of you. Uh, exalted his word above his name. Is it 139? Yeah, uh, no, it's not. 138, 138. Verse 2, 138, Psalm 138 and verse 2. So if you got a Bible split in half, you'll be writing Psalms and then go to 138. Now, this is what God thinks of his word. Now, that's what you're holding in your lap. This is the very words of God. Here's what he thinks about it. Verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou, so thou is just, or thou, he's talking to God, thou, Hast, hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That is how much the Lord thinks of his word. He's taken his word and exalted it above his name. That's where he puts it. Now, do you know how high the Lord's name is? One day the Bible says in the book of Philippians chapter 2 that one day at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know why that's a big deal? Even the devil himself is going to have to bow down and bend the knee at the name of Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And God took his word and exalted it above that. So he looks at these Pharisees and he says, he says that you make, uh, you make the word of God of none effect through your tradition. So you got to watch out for that tradition. So here, now let's go back over, uh, get back on track here, back in Romans chapter 9. So Israel was to the point they were so far off the rails, they weren't even following the law. They were following their tradition of what they thought the law said. So they had kind of added on to it. But even in that, they did not attain under the law of righteousness. And the reason why is because in verse 32, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by works, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So here's the thing. In order to get to heaven, you have to be righteous like Jesus Christ. Okay, you all know the verse. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Right, you know that verse? Now the glory of God is Jesus Christ. So we've all heard the illustration where, where people think you take your good works and your bad works, you put them in scales, right? A lot of you thought that before you got saved. You put, take your good works and bad works, you put them in a scale, and God will weigh them out. And if your good works outweighed your bad works, you get into heaven. If it didn't, you went to hell, right? That's what a lot of people thought. But the thing is, the Lord takes all of them, puts them in one side, puts Jesus Christ in the other, and nobody can match up to Jesus Christ. Why? For all of sin to come short of the glory of God. They're short. They, can't, they don't make it. They don't make it. So what you need to get to heaven is you have to be righteous like Jesus Christ. You know what righteous is, right? That's, it's right. It's perfect. Nobody in this room is perfect. So that's why Jesus Christ says, I'd be willing to give you my righteousness, and it's by faith. See that? Now, what happened? What happened? Now, this is the difference. So if you read the book of Acts uh, sometime, you'll notice that there's a transition that takes place. So in the beginning of the book of Acts, when Peter is preaching to the Jews, they accept the preaching and they're like, wow, we killed Jesus. We killed our Messiah. What do we got to do in light of this? And he says, well, in light of this, repent and be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. And so they do that. And then time goes on, and you'll start to notice there becomes a shift. And, find, and the Jews start rejecting the message of Jesus Christ. And they keep rejecting and keep rejecting. And four specific times as a whole, they reject Jesus Christ. And at the end of the book of Acts, Paul says, fine. I'm going to turn to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles will receive it. And thank God <laughs> that we got in on something really good. <laughs> Now, here's what he says in verse 32. This kind of sums it up. This is the difference in the Jews and the Gentiles where, and, and how they perceive Jesus Christ. He says, wherefore, so why did they not attain uh, to that, uh, the law of righteousness? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Now, notice there's a distinction between faith and works. Uh, works cannot save you. If you try to be a good person to go to heaven, you'll never make it. Because nobody is as good as Jesus Christ. So you must get saved by faith. Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. See that? Through faith. What is faith? Faith is you believing in something that you cannot see, but you've got evidence that it is there. 
The Bible puts it like this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right, verse 32. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. All right, what's the stumbling stone that they stumbled at? As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him, that's that stumbling stone and rock of offense, shall not be ashamed. All right, so there was a stumbling stone that was put in front of these Jews and they stumbled at it. It became a stumbling stone. You guys know a stump, a stumble, it's like a trip. And they tripped over it. It bothered them. They couldn't get over this thing. But it says it was a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him, the antecedent to the word him is the stumbling stone and rock of offense. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. All right, let's go ahead. This is a makeup of two different verses. Go to Isaiah 28 and Isaiah 8. We'll take them one at a time. We'll start with Isaiah uh, 28. Isaiah 28. Now, what you're going to find out is Jesus Christ is that stumbling stone and rock of offense. So if you try to talk to a Jew today and try to talk to him about Jesus, he's going to have a hard, he's going to have a hard time with that. They don't want to believe uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. All right, Isaiah, and we're in Isaiah 28, Isaiah 28. <clears throat> so uh, this this passage that we read over in Romans is a combination of two verses, Isaiah uh, 28 and Isaiah 8. Did I tell you 28 first? Okay, good. That's what we'll go to. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion. And that uh, you saw it in the New Testament with an S. Sion. So Zion and Sion are the same thing. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, in the uh, New Testament, it says, He that believeth on him shall not be ashamed. All right, verse 17, Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and water shall overflow the hiding place. So notice the Lord says in verse 16, He's going to lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. It's called a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. Now hold your place here and go over to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah 8. Now it's talking about the stone. And now you're going to see the stone of stumbling and rock of offense that you read about. So Isaiah chapter 8, and we'll start in verse 14. Isaiah 8 and verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. Well, who's the he that's going to be a sanctuary uh, and a stone of stumbling and a rock. Who is it? Well, let's back up to verse 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him, the Lord of hosts, be your fear and let him, the Lord of hosts, be your dread. And he, the Lord of hosts, shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel. So the one who is going to be the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense or even a sanctuary was the Lord of hosts. So how do we explain that? Well, to some he's a sanctuary, but to some he's a stone of stumbling and he's a rock of offense. So how is he a sanctuary? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. There's going to come a time in your life where the only one who's going to be able to help you is the Lord. And you're going to run to him for help. You're going to need to. And you know what he is? He's a sanctuary. But you know what he is for other folks? They don't want to go to him. And he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But notice what he calls him here, the Lord of hosts. And that's what he's called. Now, you'll want to, in one hand, you have Isaiah. Get, get some markers if you need to so you can look back. Okay, I, I want to have you see them all. Now, you have Isaiah 8, Isaiah 28. You've got Romans chapter 9. Now go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. Giving you your biblical exercise tonight. 
Now, the more you stay in the book, the, the, the easier it'll get. 1 Peter chapter 2. So in the Old Testament, when we read in Isaiah chapter 8, the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense was the Lord of hosts. Now let's go to Isaiah, I mean 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Do you know who this is talking about? It's talking about Jesus Christ. Now, okay, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 7 is where we're at right now. So it, it, it repeats, he quotes Isaiah in verse 6. And then in verse 7 it says, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. The, the he is a reference to that chief cornerstone who is elect and precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. You know who that is? That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the stone which the builders disallowed. All right, what does that mean? So they rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected him. They disallowed it. We don't want Jesus. That's what they said. The Jews stood there and they said this. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Remember that? When they said, a Pilate said, do I give you Barabbas? And they, and they said, uh, what do I do with Jesus? And he said, he said uh, crucify him. We don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. Verse 8 and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense is Jesus Christ. But notice the Old Testament called him the Lord of hosts. You know what that shows you? Jesus Christ, when he showed up, he's the Lord. That's who he is. He's the Lord. Uh, look over at Matthew chapter... Uh, 21, but before you jump from 1 Peter, before you jump from 1 Peter, notice it says in verse uh, 7, I'm trying to connect the verses for you. This is how you study the scriptures. Verse 7, it says, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. All right, now let's hear Jesus quote that over in Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Almost done. Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? <laughs> and that usually was their problem. They weren't Bible readers. Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? So he's talking about himself. It's kind of like this. When, when Jesus Christ looked at Peter, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Now, many people teach that the rock that the church was built upon was Peter, but the rock, according to the Scriptures, was Jesus Christ. You already saw that. Jesus Christ was a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. So here's how you have to, this is visual, you have to watch. So he goes like this. He looks at Peter, and he points to Peter, and he goes, Thou art Peter. And then he says, and upon this rock, pointing to himself, I'll build my church. It's like he stood there and he said, uh, he said, I am the bread of heaven. This is the bread that came down from heaven. He pointed to himself. So he points at Peter, thou art, th th uh, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, talking about himself, I'll build the church. So the church wasn't built on Peter. The church was built on Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the foundation. The Bible says other foundation can no man lay, and that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I mean, remember that illustration where there were two guys. One was foolish and one was wise. The foolish built his house upon the sand, and the other one built his house upon the rock. You remember this, right? And we have the, story, the song that you sang in Sunday school. And the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods, right? You remember that? And then what happened? The house on the sand went flat like that, right? <laughs> And so the uh, and then the, when the when the um, when splat sorry splat or flat it it crushed right? it went down, but the one on the rock but the house on the rock stood firm right that's how it goes all right I'm now I'm all questioning myself get the song right, 
And so then we finish that thing by saying, now build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the rock and he is the foundation. And that is the starting point. The starting point is receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That's the starting point. All right, let's go ahead and uh, uh, finish this thing up here. So notice Jesus tells them. He talks about himself. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore said I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So he's talking to the Jews. And so prophetically speaking, he says the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you and it's going to be given to a nation that will accept it. That's the Gentiles. That's what we're reading about in Romans chapter 9. Is it all starting to make sense and start to click now? All right, verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. How could they fall on the stone? Well, it's a stone of stumbling. So they're tripping over it. But on whomsoever it shall fall, so the stone falls on it, on, on them, it will grind into powder. Now, we don't have time to get into it tonight, but if you match this up with the book of Daniel, you'll find there's an image in the book of Daniel. And all of a sudden, a stone made without hands comes and hits that image in the feet and takes and just explodes that thing and grinds it to powder. And that stone is Jesus Christ. And that has to do with the second coming of Christ. And when he comes back, boom, he blows the whole thing up. So whoever, whoever trips on it, stumbles on it, falls on it, they'll be broken. That's the first coming of Christ. He's a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. But on whomsoever it shall fall, that's the second coming of Christ. It'll grind into powder. You see how you have the first and second coming in that one verse? All right, now let's go back over here uh, to our text. Now there's, um, I know I told you to have a lot of uh, passages. Uh, sorry about that. So I want to, so if you have first, Peter, if you don't have them, don't worry, because I'm just going to kind of uh, run through this really quick and then we'll be done. So in Romans chapter 9 and verse 33, he says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And it's clear who that is now, right? You know who that is. That's Jesus Christ. And whosoever believeth on him. Well, now I know what he's talking about. Because in the verse, the hymn is referring to the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And when you compare scripture with scripture, you know who that is. It's Jesus Christ. You see, there's a difference from believing in Jesus versus believing on Jesus. To believe in something is to believe in its existence. To believe on it is to trust it. So, for example, I can believe in this piano bench. I believe this is a fantastic piano bench. It's a great piano bench, wonderful piano bench. To believe on it is to trust it. See that? So what happened? When I got saved, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I put my faith and trust in him that he could save me and I wouldn't go to hell. And the truth is, if he can't save me, nobody can. There was a preacher one time and he had a he would go preach a, a meeting. And uh, after we get done preaching this meeting, the pastor's wife would come to him and, and, and say, I really I'm doubting my salvation. So he'd run over some verse on eternal security with her. And uh, and we get things settled. And then he come back, uh, you know, later and, and she still had problem with it. And, uh, you know, an another meeting, and she would still have a problem with it. And one day, he's, uh, this, he would run over the verses, and one day, it's a, he's, he's coming uh, uh, done with the meeting, and he thought they had gotten it all squared away. And as the preacher is driving uh, uh, him to the airport, he looks behind him, and their lights flashing, honking the horn. It was the, it was the preacher's wife. And they pulled him over, and she said, I guess got to know, I, I'm doubting my salvation. I don't know if I'm going to heaven, please. And finally, the, the, the preacher got a little frustrated. He said, well, sis, what are you trusting in? And she says, well, I know what you're going to want me to say. And I know what the answer is. He says, I didn't ask you that. What are you trusting in to get you to heaven? She says, well, I, I know what I should say. No, no, no. What are you trusting in to get you to heaven? And she said, well, I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, well, I got bad news for you, sister. He said, what? What's the bad news? <laughs> and he said, uh, you couldn't go to hell if you tried. <laughs> Boy, isn't that a blessing? You see, look, I, if I could lose my salvation, I would have lost it. I mean, look, man, if you known everything I've done since I've gotten saved, just the thoughts I've had in my head, man, you wouldn't even be here listening to me preach. But I thank God that he kept me saved. Amen. I thank God for that. All right, now look in our text here. It says, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. See how it says that at the end of verse 33? Now, real quick, I'll make this, I'll make this fast. Over in the book of Isaiah, because I want to get us out right on the top of the hour. 
And the book of Isaiah says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not make haste. Here it says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And in the book of Peter it says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be confounded. So haste, ashamed, confounded. These are three things. Now the context of Isaiah chapter 28 deals with the tribulation. And in that thing, the, uh, the Jews make, a, make a, uh, a covenant with death and hell, and there's this terror that comes after them, but some of them don't. And some of them don't make a covenant with death and hell. Instead, they believe on Jesus, and in doing so, when that terror comes after them, the ones that believed on Jesus, they don't have to make haste, they don't have to run from it. Now, spiritually speaking, you cannot hasten fast enough to get saved. If you're lost, you want to get saved, you want to get saved now just as fast as you possibly can. <laughs> don't wait, don't wait. I remember uh, I've talked with some folks, and man, they, they'll, they'll hear it, and they'll say, yeah, I know, I want to get saved, but they just, you know, they'll kind of wait, and they'll put it off. Don't, don't wait, man, get saved as fast as you can. Now, that's number one. Number two, it says in the text, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. It says it again, if you hop across the page in verse 11 of chapter 10, but the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, the context has to do with one day you're going to stand before a judgment. And when you stand before a judgment, when you see people pitched off into hell, you won't have to be ashamed for trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You may be ashamed of a lot of other things you've done in this life, and you may have some regrets and not want anybody to know about it, but believing on Jesus Christ is not one of those things you have to be ashamed about. And then the last one talked about, he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. To be confounded, like... Uh, 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 where, where, where you don't know, where you're kind of mentally unsure, you, you just you don't know about it. Look, as a Christian, you can have assurance of where you're going when you die, not because of anything you did, but because of what Jesus Christ did. The last thing Jesus said when he was on the cross was, it is finished. We like to sing the song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. <laughs> And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something tonight. Uh, the, the, those Jews, the, Jesus Christ became a stumbling block, but thank God we got the righteousness of God, and that righteousness is by faith, and it's by faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, and you believe on him. The Bible says, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. And so he's something you don't have to be ashamed about. Now, you may be ashamed. There may be times where you get a little ashamed in this life. You don't want to speak up for the Lord. You may not want to witness. You know, you get a little embarrassed. I mean, that kind of happens sometimes. Uh, but I'll tell you what, one day when you stand before God and you see people pitched off into hell, you're going to be so thankful of the day you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Man, I'm glad I made that decision. <laughs> and uh, that's why we got to keep on telling people about the Lord and witnessing to them and putting tracks out. And hopefully we can get some more folks to make that same decision. All right, let's all stand, head bowed and eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for today. We uh, thank you for that salvation that's found by faith in uh, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to be bold witnesses for you and forgive us for the times that we are ashamed uh, to speak up for your name. Lord, that's, uh, that's uh, on us and that's uh, a sin and we do confess it. And we ask that you'll give us boldness. Uh, and we thank you, Lord, that, that uh, you are that, that uh, precious cornerstone, as the book of Peter said. Now, Father, I pray that the scriptures were very clear and understandable tonight as uh, we read through it. And I pray that as people read uh, through the Bible for themselves, that they take the same exact approach that we took here tonight. And they just look at the scripture and take it for what it says and compare scripture with scripture. And let the Holy Spirit be their teacher and guide. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here in church tonight and being able to worship together and sing songs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, let's sing a song and then we'll go home. I'm in the red book, the red hymnal, and uh, that song I said at the very end, Jesus paid it all.